Welcome everybody to our video conference number two for the Waddell Sea Expedition. My name is Lizzie Rosenberger and I'm the uh, manager of the Waddell Sea Expedition, working with Reach the World in partnership with the Explorers Club and the Royal Geographic Society. And we are bringing the expedition in Antarctica live to you um, with support from the Flotilla Foundation. So we're very excited to be bringing you here today. We have got a number of schools joining us um, from pretty much the Northeast and then also out in Illinois. So today with Holly, we're gonna hear about life aboard the ship and she's got some very exciting and impressive members aboard with her. And before we move into uh, Holly, I just wanna give a few reminders about our video conference and then we'll let everyone say hello to Holly and the team. So a few reminders, we're gonna have just one person unmuted at a time. So I'll be in charge of muting and unmuting. And then at the end when it's time for questions and answers, I will help facilitate that as well. We have the chat feature. So the chat, you are welcome to please join into the chat and write questions, comments, thoughts along the way that we have. And that is, uh, we're monitoring that as well. So let's get started with some of our introductions. So we have up here, I'm gonna go ahead and unmute Mr. Whitney's class. If you wanna say hello and tell us where you are from. Excellent, and so they are from Grafton, Massachusetts. Next, we have Miss Mesk's class, so here you are. Hi! Hi! Hi. Excellent, and next we have Miss Ives' class. Wonderful. And up next, we have Miss Palmer. <laughs> Hi. Hi. We are from Tennant Harbor, Maine. Excellent. And we have Miss Garvey's class. Excellent, and they are from Illinois. And last but not least, we have Ms. Kutzman's class. I will go ahead and turn it on over to Holly and her crew um, so we can get started with the call. Hello, everyone. Hello, give us a wave if you can hear us. Yeah, brilliant, cool. So, uh, <laughs> hi. <laughs> so firstly, thank you everyone for following the blog. Um, we are still in Antarctica. We're still at the Larsen Sea Ice Shelf. Um, and I am joined today by two amazing guests, two very, very important guests on the ship. So we are very lucky to be having them here. They are the glue to the Agulhas too. I have Sibon Gile to my right over yeah. here. She is the purser, but also the navigational officer. And I have Jermaine to my left, who is the chief Hi. steward. So I thought that I would start by passing over to each of them to just give a little a bit of an introduction of who they are, where they're from, and what their role is on the ship. So to see from Hello, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm Sibongile Yazini. I'm from South Africa. <laughs> <laughs> On board the vessel, I'm signed on as the person, and I'm also a navigational officer. I've joined the vessel 2014 to 2015, and I've joined again this year as the purser. What is the role of the purser? What do you do day to day? All right, the purser um, generally is the head of department for catering department. So basically, it's all about ensuring the galley, the food, and the stewards, 
and ensuring every time and all times the vessel is kept clean. Also, I do stock takes, um, make sure that for each voyage we'll have enough um, food for the voyage. So all of those pictures that you've seen on my blog with me eating the food, basically Sibongile makes sure that we are all fed on the ship. So it's a very important role, otherwise we'd have some very unhappy people on the ship. <laughs> and then we've also got Jermaine here, who's the chief steward. Hi everybody. Hi everyone. <laughs> <laughs> my name is Jermaine Gambo. I am the chief steward on board of the SA Gallus II. I've been on board since 2017. My main role is um, I'm in charge of the steward department. So our main role is for cleanliness and hygiene of the vessel. Um, well, I've been working at sea since uh, 2008. So this is like my 10th year. Whoa. Yeah. And what, what do you do kind of day to day to ensure that the ship is clean? Day to day basis, I do um, daily rounds, which means I start at six and I do my floor walk um, through accommodation, all the accommodation spaces, make sure that all the stewards are doing what they're supposed to be doing, you know, keeping everything clean and tidy. And um, what else am I doing? It's a very important job. I mean, you wouldn't think it, but keeping a ship clean is, a, is, is quite difficult. We have 90 passengers on board at the moment. And so we get, we are very lucky. We get our sheets changed once a week. We get new towels. You know, we get make sure that all everything that we eat of is very tidy and clean and this vessel itself is almost like a five-star hotel it's so tidy so we are extremely extremely lucky so i thought i'd just start perhaps by telling you guys a little bit about what we've been up to in the last week um uh, there's been quite a lot of drama on the agulhas 2 for the last week <laughs> it's been a very eventful last five days so as you know, on this expedition, we've got with us AUVs, which are autonomous underwater vehicles. Now these go underneath the ice to monitor and take photographs of underneath the ice shelf and also of the seabed. We sent an AUV for the first time underneath an, underneath an ice flow and it got stuck. So when it came to the surface, we all thought, you know, we'll get the AUV back, we'll upload the data and we'll have some awesome images, but it never surfaced. So we had a very intense four days of trying to find an AUV and the ocean is an enormous place. <laughs> so we, had, we knew that it was stuck in an ice flow. We started by sending down an ROV, which is a remotely op operated vehicle, which is kind of like a, it's a, a PlayStation, like it's controlled from the surface and it's a big robot that goes under the water and it has claws and it picks up things from the, from the seabed. So we sent an ROV underneath the ice shelf to go and collect the AUV. It was very, very dramatic. And these two were ensuring that everybody, while we were doing that, was smiling, were well fed, were, the living standards were very good. So yes, it was a very dramatic four to five days. And I was wondering if maybe we'd pass back to Lizzie and see if anybody has any questions for the purser and the chief steward on board. Yes, excellent. And we also have some requests to see some pictures um, of what an AUV is, as well as some photos of the ship. And Holly has shared with us some of those so we can share them from our end or Holly we can share them from your end as well. But if there is a class that has a question to start with for the purser or the steward, would you like to raise your hands um, so we can see that you have a question and we'll answer those first. All right, it looks like Miss Garvey's class. So I will go ahead and unmute Miss Garvey's class. Oh, we're unmuted. They're, they're asking us. Why are you going to Antarctica? Where are they in Antarctica? Question. Oh, that's a very good question. Why are we in Antarctica? There are two main reasons that we're here at the moment. The first is to 
do some science here. Antarctica is a very little, little explored area and only a few people in the world have ever been here. It's one of the remote, remotest areas on our globe. So we're here sending down remotely operated vehicles and autonomous underwater vehicles to try and document the little searched science of the region. Um, and then the second reason that we are here is that in 1915, an English explorer called Ernest Shackleton came here with his crew to try and reach parts of the world that no one has been to before. And his ship got stuck in the ice and it got crushed, but oh. everybody survived. So all of the crew members of the Endurance survived, but the ship went down in the ice. So we are here and we're going to try our very best to go and locate the Endurance ship, which we think is about 3,000 meters below the sea. That's why we're here. <laughs> Excellent. So we, it looks like we also have a question from Ms. Palmer um, and her students. So I'm gonna go ahead and unmute you and see if you wanna ask your question as well. Wait, what? Am I, oh, am I on? <laughs> um, we want to know how, you, how the AUV can determine the depth of the ice. So the AUV has, it's remote, it's controlled from a operating station in the online room on board the ship. And we send messages to the AUV in a, when it's in a supervised mode. So we're constantly monitoring where the AUV is in the water, and that gives us an idea of what the depth of the water is. The AUV doesn't actually measure the ice thickness, but it can go into the water and either search the seabed or, with our new AUV, look upwards and search underneath the ice. Excellent. We also, I'm just gonna go ahead and share my screen really quickly so you all can see um, a picture of what it looks like launching um, the AUV. So I'm gonna go ahead and do that really quickly and Holly can maybe tell us a little bit about what this looks like. So you should be able to see my screen now. And, oh, sorry about that. So if we go to uh, present, there we are. So this picture, Dun, 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 is uh, a picture of the deck, the back deck of the vessel. And you can see what they're wearing. And then right here is this uh, orange colored vehicle. And that is the AUV. Holly, I'm gonna unmute you to see if you wanna explain anything else about that. So an AUV stands for Autonomous Underwater Vehicle. Um, as you can see on the photo, I know it's slightly cut, but they almost look like torpedoes and they go under the water up to 5,000 meters depth. And they have on the side of the AUV something called side scan sonar. And what this does is when it's going close to the seabed, it monitors and sees if there are any anomalies on the seabed to see if we can find any wrecks or anything that might be human made that ended up on the seabed. So that could be aircraft, that could be ships, anything that might have crashed and fallen into the water. Um, and that's what it does. So once it's run its mission, which can be between kind of 10 hours or 60 hours, the AUV comes to the surface, the vessel then meets the AUV, and we bring it back onto the vessel and upload what we call is a payload. And the payload contains all the data that is necessary to be able to know if there's anything on the seabed that might be a shipwreck. Um, so we have a team of data surveyors who spend hours flicking through all the side scan sonar data to see if there's anything that might come up that could be a wreck underneath the water. Um, but on this expedition, we are also using the autonomous underwater vehicles for science reasons. So the upward facing AUV is scanning underneath the ice shelf, um, which is simultaneously running with a drone. And I'm sure most of you know what drones are. They're very popular. Um, these are quite intense drones. <laughs> They're very advanced scientific drones that will hopefully run parallel to the AUV and will be able to monitor the ice thickness. 
the AUV will also take upward facing photographs to see if there's anything interesting that lives underneath the ice shelf. Excellent. Thank cool, you isn't it? so much. And then while I have my screen shared, um, Holly, I'm going to go through and show a couple of the pictures that you have sent ahead of time so that we can see if there's a few more things as I click through that you want to explain um, to the students as well. So let me go back to the very beginning. Um, right here. So if you want to give just a quick explanation of any of these as we pass by, um, feel free. How's that sound? Sure. So this is my cabin that we are sitting in right now. Um, and maybe, Jermaine, you can tell us a bit about how the cabins are and how many different rooms, how many people can fit in certain cabins. And okay, so um, the cabin that Holly is in or the one that's on the screen is a single bird cabin. So there's just one bong. Um, bongs is the bed <laughs> in the cabin. Um, we got uh, four birds and two birds as well. So birds are beds bird. as well. Well, well, well. Yeah, you could say yeah, the, the, the amount of people that can go into the cabin. Yeah. Yeah, so the, it's a two birth will be two people and the four birth will be for four passengers. Um, yeah, we've got your basic uh, shower, your bed, your day bunk, which will be your couch over there and um, your work desk, um, your cupboard as well, to pack all your clothing in, and you've got a bookshelf. <laughs> yeah, we also have our own bathrooms with showers, so I'm actually living in an ensuite bedroom right now. I don't have that at home. That's pretty nice. <laughs> I think it's just buffering a little. Hello, can you still hear us? Yes, okay, you can still hear us. Yeah. Cool, do you want to talk about this? So Sibongile is just gonna talk us through about where we eat. Um, sorry. All right, so what you're seeing on the screen now is the dining salon. Um, in the middle, you will see a guy wearing a white, that's a steward. So basically, when we have lunch, supper and breakfast, Everyone will be seated inside the salon and then they will take the orders as per the menu and then the stewards will go to the galley, galley being the kitchen where the food is prepared by the chef and then dinner or lunch or breakfast will be served. So we're very lucky. We actually get table service here. I mean, you, this is such an advanced ship not many vessels offer the service that the agulas 2 does we not only get our rooms changed and clean but we also get table service at dinner every night um it's an amazing service here. It's, it's and the food is delicious as well so we're very very lucky excellent and then this is a, a picture of holly with one of her first meals um, and then we'll go through and show one more about this space as well. You've just caught me out, Lizzie. I am, um, I, <laughs> I might get in trouble because it's actually allowed in the kitchen, but my friend Christoph and I went in to go and take a photo. So these guys didn't know that I did it, so I might get told <laughs> off. So basically ask first, guys. <laughs> No, there are very strict rules on the ship because of hygiene reasons. Um, the, the hygiene levels of the ship are, are amazing. You have to keep everything very, very clean. Um, the galley, which is the kitchen, which you might call the canteen, um, where the food is prepared, is at a very, very high hygiene standard. Um, and it's enormous. This is only probably one eighth of how big it is. Yes. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Um, let's see. Okay. Oh, no. Excellent. So maybe we'll, I'm going to stop sharing my screen for a minute and we can see if there are any questions that anyone has. So let's see, are there any classrooms out there that would like to ask a question? It looks like Mr. Whitney's class. We'll go ahead and unmute you all. Hi, everyone. Oh. Hi. Do you know sponsors? 
Do we have sponsors? Yeah. We have a, an organization who are supporting us to be out here. Um, oh, you mean sponsors as in merchandising sponsors. We, we have a re really good company, three really good companies who've, who've given us clothing. Um, we have Safety Mate, who are based in South Africa, Drifters, who are also based in South Africa, and um, First Ascent. Oh, uh, First Ascent. First Ascent, yes. yes. First Ascent. So we, they've actually all given us all a set of clothing. I'll just show you my jacket so you can see how cool it is. So every single Weddell Sea Expedition participant got given a Weddell Sea Expedition jacket, which you can see has the logo here. Um, we also all got given a base layer and leggings to wear to keep us warm. We got hats, gloves, um, everything like that. So we were very lucky. We um, have worked with a lot of different organizations to, to um, get out here, which we're all really grateful for everyone who's helped us out. So yeah. All right, we're going to go over to Miss Ives' class for a question. You can do it. Go ahead. Go on. I forgot. You wanted to ask about the A and B. Oh, yeah. So how do you get a job on one of these expeditions? Really good question. Um, so there are, many, there are many different ways that you can get involved with expeditions. Um, I did for myself i um that, i mean there's uh, oh am I, am I muted can you all hear me yeah okay cool um so i studied history at university um and i work for a company called ocean infinity who operate these autonomous underwater vehicles um and i came through it for a passion of scuba diving and wreck history but you can do training programs with many different companies that can train you on how to use remotely operated vehicles. You can do training programs on how to operate under autonomous underwater vehicles. Um, you can also study science and get involved with the science side of things. And you can work with people, you know, opportunities arise where you can study up the Antarctic um, area and you will be op offered opportunities. There are also many, many different programs that offer you um, opportunities to come out on expeditions. So even if you just Googled online, you know, um, a science expedition or expeditions I'd like to go on. There are different companies that you can look into that can offer different trips. So it depends what you're really interested in. You could also work on a ship That's like correct. these two have. Um, so you can be a steward, you can work as a navigation officer, um, you can be a captain. Um, so it depends if you want to go into engineering, science, management, history, there's a whole array of different job opportunities that you can get into with working in the marine world. Yeah. Great, let's go next to uh, Ms. Palmer. You have another question that you wrote in to the chat, if you're ready to ask that question. How long will the expedition take? <laughs> All right. Um, this expedition will be taking forty-five days. Four, five days. Yes. So we, the Weddell Sea Expedition participants, have joined the Agulhas Two um, in a place called Penguin Bukta, which was in Antarctica, and we will be here for forty-five days. But these two. <laughs> are going to be on the vessel for a lot longer so maybe you can tell us how long you've been on and how long you're staying on all right so we started the voyage on the 6th of december and we'll be going back in south africa on the four, on the 11th of march this year that's the 6th of december to march 11th that's christmas here <laughs> new year's here it's a long long time Valentine's Year. Yeah, yeah. Valentine's Day. <laughs> <laughs> so it's when we when we met the ship in Penguin Bookter, this is where I met these two lovely people. And um, we started our transit to the Larsen Sea Ice Shelf, which took about eight to ten days. Then we had um, we have about 
20 days for the science and for the rec search, and then we'll begin our transit back to Penguin Book Tour. And then that's a whole nother adventure for flying home on a helicopter, two different flights. And then for me, flying all the way back to England, a lot of people applying back to the States. A lot of people live in South Africa. Um, I'm sure some of you saw my blog post. There are actually about 15 different countries represented on the vessel currently. So we're from all over the globe. Excellent. Is there another class? Looks like Ms. Ives has one more question for us. Let's hear from you. Um, I was wondering, um, have you discovered any new species of animals? Well, that's a good question as well. So we have a really good team of marine biologists on board the expedition with us um, from the University of Oxford and the University of Essex. Um, and they, we have discovered quite a lot of unknown types of sponges and corals. Um, we have seen an octopus, we've seen lots of different fish, we've seen lots of different kelp, but we will not know until we've gone through the hours and hours of ROV footage that we have, until we've identified every single species, whether we can, where they are, they are new, because these, these biologists, they have to go through this, the video footage and see um, what species there are and compare them to the ID books that have already been published. If they find something that has never been found before, then we will have our brand new species, which they will be able to name. This is why I'm trying to be very good friends with them. I want there to be a species named after me. <laughs> <laughs> but so we, we won't really know, but they are excited because they have seen lots of different sponges, a lot more ver variety in the marine life out here than, than they anticipated. And nobody has ever used ROVs before in Antarctica to study the marine area here. So it's very exciting. It's the first time. It's the first time. Great. And did I see another hand up in Mr. Whitney's class from earlier? Uh, let's unmute you and see if you have another question. Go right ahead. Is that has climate change affected us or is it affecting us on our expedition? Is that what the question was? Yeah, yeah, yeah the, the latter. Well, one of the primary scientific reasons that we're out here is to study the area to see the effects of climate change. Um, right now we're in, in summer in Antarctica, so the ice caps are melting anyway. Um, it's hard to tell whether that's a result of climate change. Um, but what we can do is compare that the data that we find here to data that might have been gathered from 20, 30 years ago and see if climate change has sped up any, any ice melting. Um, so we can't really know the effects of climate change until we post analyze the data. Um, but that is one of the most, one of the primary goals of the scientific side of the expedition is to see the effects of climate change here. Um, and the other thing as well is that there are very strict laws in Antarctica um, about how we interact with the wildlife here. Um, so we, there are lots and lots of penguins, lots of Weddell seals, lots of leopard seals, minke whales, humpback whales, orca whales. Um, and I don't know if you guys have seen, but one of our, our chief of exploration and um, head of the archeology span side of, of the expedition, Menson Bound, does a, ex uh, a um, expedition blog every single day, which is available on our website. And in one of his blogs, he talks about the difference in the diary entries from when Shackleton was on his expedition to today and how there was a huge array of whales present in, in the area that we're in now. We, we haven't seen quite so many whales, but we've seen a lot of penguins. Again, it's hard to tell if that's seasonal or if that's effects of, of climate change. So that's what, that is what we are, we are investigating while we are out here. Um, and post-expedition, we will have a better understanding as well constantly getting in data to understand the effects of climate change in the Antarctic Peninsula. Excellent. And we have on the explore.reachtheworld.org website, if you go under the resources and daily blog, that's where you can follow along with Minson Bounds uh, journal postings that he's writing daily that Holly is talking about. 
Um, and I want to show you one picture quickly to see if you can find what Holly, one of the things Holly just mentioned. Uh, this is a picture and the caption is, can you see the Waddell seal? So if you take a look at this photograph, just, can any of you spot where you think that this seal might be in the photograph? If you think you have an idea as to where it is, you can go ahead and put your hand up in the air. We got a couple. I see some waving hands. So let's go down to Mr. Whitney's class and see if you guys can describe to us where you see the seal in this photograph. It's like under the ice, those like little black spots. So under the ice, can you be more specific in your detail and talk nice and loud so Holly um, and her team can also hear you? Under the water, but above like that other layer of ice under the water, is like those black silhouettes. Hmm, Holly, what do you think? Yeah, so um, you can spot the Weddell seal right there. Oh, I'm pointing at the screen, that was more. Um, so the, <laughs> this was actually really exciting because we were all on the aft deck of the ship, which is the back of the ship, um, after a very intense game of ping pong. And we came out for some fresh air and we saw two Weddell seals sitting on the edge of this ice, ice flow here. Um, and this one was very alarmed and jumped quite high in the air into the water. But because the Antarctic water is so clear, you can actually see through the water. And, and as, well, as you quite rightly mentioned, you can see the under, underside of the um, ice I'm flow. Sorry. Yeah. And, and um, that's the Weddell seal just there. And it was swimming, kind of going between the two different parts of the ice and underneath. And it was playing around and teasing us a lot. They're very playful animals. <laughs> um, and I don't know if you guys know, but on an iceberg, what you see is only one fifth of the size an iceberg actually is. So it's kind of four times, five times the size that it is underneath the water. Excellent. So are there any, um, we can have time for just a few more questions if anyone else has any questions for Holly or the team that's on board. All right, I see a hand over here in Mr. Whitney's class. Go right ahead. Uh, does the difference in culture and language affect how you guys work together? Because like last conference, you guys said that there's some people in Russia and like England and like, is it is it confusing if one person speaking in Russian and the other person speaking in English? I only caught the end of that. Do you mind just repeating the question again? Does the difference in language affect and culture affect how you guys work together? If like one person's from Russia and the other's from Britain, is like the difference in language and how you, like in one person's trying to speak in Russian, the other one's in English. Does that affect anything? That's a really good question again. Um, so I'll start answering and then you guys can. Um, so the, the language that's most spoken on board the expedition while we're here is English. Everybody here can speak English. Um, and you're quite right to pick up. It's not so much about the language that people speak. It's about the culture that people are from and respecting everyone's culture. So most of the crew are South African. So we've been learning some I mean, I've been learning some South African songs, some Zulu songs, some Afrikaans <laughs> songs. Um, and it's all about engaging with people from different cultures. So how do you guys find it having visitors on board who are different cultures? Um, it's, quite, it's quite very interesting, you know, because something in your culture is a norm and then in other person's culture, it's not a norm. But you um, kind of get away to both um, put aside your differences and just as long as the job gets done, that's the main point of everything. Mm. Get the job done, 
and everyone is happy. And with the, <laughs> <laughs> with the language, um, the vessel um, is an English, okay, the um, language for the vessel, working language is English. So everyone is expected to know English. So you got different um, ships on other vessels. You can have, if more than 80% of that crew is let's say um, Italian, then the working language of that vessel okay. might be Italian. So it depends vessel to vessel as mm -hmm. well. What do you find, Jermaine, that when, when you're on off hours, you speak in English or do you speak? Um, well, English and Afrikaans okay. mostly. And, um, but I like the whole interaction with everyone else because you get a chance to learn like the different cultures and the language, which is cool. Mm. So yeah, I'm speaking some French and some Russian, yeah, which is yeah. really nice, yeah. So the interaction is quite cool. Yeah, and I think that everybody on board is very sensitive to the fact there are so many different cultures and nationalities on board. Um, and we all take the time, I hope, to engage with each other and ask each other where they're from. So, you know, there are a lot of Corsa speaking people on board the Agulas. And part of the Corsa culture is that the names that they have, we don't have this in the Western world or in America, that um, you name your child and it has meaning to the word. So, you know, for example, Sezeko, he, he, he has a daughter called Sama, which means all together. Yes. Yeah, so all together. And then Sibongile means... Thank you. Thank you. Yes. You know, so it, it helps to, you know, to learn each other's names and learn what they mean. Yeah. Um, basically, in our culture, when you name a person, there is a meaning to that word. And hopefully, you'll follow your meaning. <laughs> yeah, which you do. We're always all saying thank you to Sibo <laughs> Yeah. So, it's a very good question. Um, but it's just about being mindful, learning, to, learning about each other, um, engaging with each other sensitively. And I think... Yeah, working together as a team. We, we have a saying on the um, Agulhas 2 as part of the Weddell Sea Expedition. And it's very cheesy, but we say one team, one dream. Um, because it is about coming together and defying, you know, there's always got to be one main objective when you're working on a ship because you're in close quarters with people a lot. Yes. Um, and we all have one goal at the end of the day. Um, successful voyage. Sorry. Yeah, successful voyage. Yeah. <laughs> And we're all here because we like being at sea, you know, ultimately. Yes. And we like going on adventures. So we're all quite like-minded, I think, at the end of the day. Excellent. Is there, are there any other questions? Does Ms. Ives' class have any questions? We've heard a couple from Mr. Whitney's. I'll go ahead, looks like it, so I'll go ahead and unmute you all and you can ask your next question. Um, do you think you might find any fossils in the ice? in the ice <laughs> it's hard to say um it, we might find some on the seabed we might find some fossilized coral on the seabed um but generally under the ice it's 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 mainly just ice um <laughs> so anything that might be in the ice will fall uh, to the seabed so we can only really tell and the marine biologists part of their team part of their work is um taking a sample box that they attach onto the ROV and as they go along the seabed with the claw of the ROV they pick things up and sample it um, because we have what we have permission from the FCO um, we have permission to, for, because it's a scientific expedition to take samples from the seabed um, so yes and, and some of this stuff we, we were telling me we've got to talk on um, the next call will be with the marine biology team so make sure you tune into it because they'll be answer, able to answer these questions in more depth but they found something that they thought was almost as old as 1400 years old on the seabed which is amazing so yes excellent Good and question. it looks like we had another hand waving in mr whitney's class so we'll pop over to you all and just make sure you ask your question nice and loudly does someone have a science question or a question about life on the ship i have a question there what do you guys do with uh, like waste, like toilet waste and stuff? Good question. <laughs> All right, so basically, <laughs> on board, <laughs> funny question. 
you have your your bathroom in your cabin pipes who connected to the engine room which in the engine room we have a switch tank so all your manure <laughs> let me use that word <laughs> <laughs> that goes from your bathroom it goes to the switch tank and from there um it gets treated and then stored into another tank and we can here in Antarctica, it's a special area, so there are rules in dumping, and you're not allowed to dump anything in Antarctica because it's a special area. So when we go outside of Antarctica, that will be more than 66 degrees south, then only we can dump, but we have a, also a book um, called MAPO, which is marine pollution, that guides us how much we can dump. And we also have rules for other general ways, so rubbish. Rubbish, rubbish. okay. So rubbish is um, basically segregated. So we have your plastics, your glass, and uh, your food waste, and tins all separate, so separated. So we have different tins for different types of garbage. Food waste, we usually also keep uh, like frozen. We keep it on board till we reach an area that we are allowed to dump. And then we'll notify the bridge and that's when we do the dumping. And what do you do with the rubbish, like the tin, the paper, the plastic? That gets stored um, down below, uh, hole number three, mm -hmm. down below, and uh, in uh, huge, um, what, do you, what do you call it? Skips, uh, but huge bins. Yeah. And uh, that we take home to South Africa. That's where that gets done. Yeah, definitely not dumped into the ocean. We don't yes. dump. We don't dump in the ocean. <laughs> no. Not, not, not tin and paper no, and plastic. Only, no. only food or waste. Only waste. That was a great question. Are there, we maybe have time for one more question from each class. So if there is another question in Ms. Ives' class, is anyone interested in one final question? Good. All right. Um, more questions we're going to save it for Friday. For Friday? Great. Excellent. So you can email them ahead of time or uh, you can wait for the video conference. So we'll stay tuned for more questions from you on Friday. And then for Mr. Whitney's class, you all have another final question? Oh my god. Sorry, uh, yeah. <laughs> um, you do for like entertainment on the uh, yeah, in like free time, what do you do for like entertainment? For fun, we okay, like we got some, we got entertainment. There's um board games in the bar areas. Um, there's also like the for crew entertainment, we have games, board games. Um, uh, what do you call this? PlayStation, PlayStation. and I. PlayStation. Yeah, we got <laughs> and, and and Xboxes. Um, we also have like uh, like a. Um, Recreational entertainment would be volleyball, table tennis. We, I think that I heard a rumor that we're going to play soccer today. 8.30. 8.30. It's on. Uh, that's in the helicopter hangar. Um, yeah, so we definitely keep busy in order to keep fit as well. Yeah. <laughs> we do, yeah. It's, 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 it's sometimes easy to forget to stay fit when you're on the ship. Um, yeah, we have a gym as well. Sure. And a sauna. We have a sauna on board the Agulhas too. So... You know, we do a yoga class every day um, with my friend Kat. She, we do cardio with Kat where she does a gym class. Um, and then we go for a sauna afterwards, which is really fun. And then often have a game of ping pong or darts or football or soccer, as you call it in America. Um, so there's lots to do. Excellent. And while just as we end up here, I'll show you a few more images that Holly had sent along earlier um, today. So let me go ahead and pull them back up. Oh, I have to share my screen with you all first. Um, so I'll go ahead and just share my screen quickly again so you can see a few more images of some of the things that Holly um, and uh, was talking about. So let's go down to this one. So this one here is what they call a tuck shop. Do any of you think you know maybe what a tuck shop actually is? 
or can you look at the picture and from the picture think about what the tuck shop might be if you have an idea you can go ahead and raise your hands and hmm I think I see a hand in Mr. Whitney's class. Go ahead, nice and loud. What do you think? <laughs> All right, was that you, Alexis? No, no. it wasn't me. Was me. All right, Luke, you want to try? Uh, to me, it looks like a bar. Oh. All right, Holly. <laughs> Yeah, you, you, it is. It's um, it is it is a bar. Um, and but we sell soft drinks, chocolates and crisps there. But sometimes when um the vessel is on other expeditions, it does serve some other drinks for people to have. Um, on this particular expedition, we just do Coca Cola, appetizer, um, arrows, um, Kit Kats. I don't know if these are chocolates you guys know. Um. So it's, it's sweet teas and soft drinks. Excellent. Um, and then as we click through a little bit more, this is, um, Holly had mentioned the bridge before, and this is where the captain does all the navigation. Um, so you can see out the windows, you can see some of the ice um, that is there in the open water that they have to navigate around. Um, so there, and there looks like two captain seats so there's some um, nice visual there for you of how they manage to get around the Waddell Sea. Uh, and then we have another image. This one um, is a picture of the front of the ship. And it's, I found it really interesting when Holly sent this one along because it's got the same view, but you can see what is in front of them is quite, quite different. Um, do you want to mention anything about these two pictures, Holly? Sure. So um, in Antarctica, we have 24 hours of daylight. So the photograph on the top is actually um, the darkest it will get in Antarctica. That's the lowest the sun will go. So these were taken two, on two separate days. And you can see at the front how different the ice conditions are. Um, the ice is constantly moving in Antarctica, which actually makes it quite difficult to operate in. Um, and maybe Sibon Gile can tell us about navigating through the ice. All right, so the most difficult thing is when we're navigating and we're doing the science work, and then ice starts to encroach on us to the vessel. So basically, at times, we have to just abort whatever science work we're doing because of the ice. So it's not always at times we have a station maybe planned for nine hours. Um, sometimes because of ice conditions, we have to leave it at seven or five hours and then you've got to stop and search for better waters and then start again with the science. Yes, mm. be patient. <laughs> yeah. The, um, the ice is difficult as we found out when we lost and found our AUV. Excellent. So I just wanted to share those few other images with you all um, and have you see some of those and there are more to come. We have Holly who's continuing to post articles onto the Reach the World journey page. So stay tuned for more updates, um, scientific updates coming along as well. Uh, and I think that will round us out for today. Um, so thank you everyone for attending. And Holly, do you want to give us a quick sneak peek of what to expect on Friday, our next conference? Sure. So firstly, I'd like to say a massive thank you to Sibon Gile and Jermaine for joining us. Um, as we said at the beginning of the call, the ship really cannot run without them. Um, and I know that they are probably quite keen to get back to work because everyone, everyone's probably in chaos because they're not there. Um, so on the next call will be a science themed call. So we've had some amazing science questions today. Um, so we will have some of the marine biologists with us talking about what they've discovered and how they have discovered it. Um, and then we'll also have some of the glaciologists who are the ones who uh, are, are learning and understanding the ice conditions in Antarctica. So join us on, I think it's 7 a.m., isn't it? Lizzie, on Friday for the call. 
Uh, it's, I think it's at 2 p.m. <laughs> oh, sorry, 7 a.m. Yes. <laughs> sorry. Time differences. Time differences. <laughs> So we, we will be at 2, 2 p.m. your time. Um, join us to hear more from the scientists. But a massive thanks to you two for taking the time out of your, your day to join us. Um, nice. And thank you all for listening. It's really exciting that we can engage with you from Antarctica. <laughs> I mean, who'd have thought that, you know, the technology is so good nowadays. I can't believe we're even having this conversation. <laughs> Just to give you an idea, let me show you out my window so you can see exactly where we are. It's awesome. Hold on. You can see, you see there? So there isn't actually that much ice out my window right now, but there's usually icebergs and it's amazing. So thank you to Reach the World as well for setting this up so that we can, we can have calls with you guys often. Excellent. And thank you all. I'm just going to go ahead and unmute our classroom so they can also say uh, goodbye. <laughs> Excellent. Well, thank you all so much, and we will look to, forward to seeing you on Friday. Bye, thank you. Bye.